art is helping us to perceive and intuit our way around reality. And it does that fundamentally by informing and influencing our imagination. And I think if you run through that idea, well, then everything is influencing our imagination, our economic framework, our job, our vocation, the sheer amount of media we consume on Instagram, it's all influencing our imagination in some way. And so then it is a matter of, well, what do I want to influence me? Experiential artist or experiential art, what is that? Big question. <laughs> um, I think it obviously it'll differ with depending on the artist or the context. Um, I guess for me, when I say I'm an experiential artist, I'm considering not just the visual elements that I produce, so projection art or motion graphics or the back screen LED for a music festival, um, but I'm considering the overall experience through the senses and through the meaning that might be perceived through what I'm doing in particular. Um, so I often work in music contexts and so I'm collaborating with a musician or a band or a producer and I'm trying to enhance what they're producing audibly through visual uh, and sort of acting as a mediator to, I guess, heighten the experience that the artist is trying to evoke and that the audience is trying to have so that they can kind of meet in the middle somewhere quicker and in a more emphasized way. Mm. So we've touched on this, but art is something that uh, needs to be experienced to be understood. You, know, you have the expression and you have the reaction. And I once thought that they, they were, that they uh, weren't mutually exclusive, but when I think about it, you can have the expression without the, without evoking any kind of reaction from that. But when you do, right in the middle there, there is, it's the experience, right? So that is what gives, defines the art piece, it, culturally anyway. And that's where your work lies, is, is in that experience. So your work itself is not necessarily the tangible expression of it, but your work is the experience that the audience has, right? So without that experience, the artwork in itself just doesn't even necessarily exist. It's like, it's just in this moment of time where they uh, embedded or immersed in it. And then it's a fleeting moment. I think, yeah, you're, you're kind of getting that. I think for me, it's experience is intangible. It's ephemeral. And so it's the artist's job to sort of provide the contours for that to happen in a particular way. And so you have some artists that are very conceptual and they're very much trying to evoke a particular idea. And then you have others that are very non-conceptual and it's quite literal and it's, this is what it is. And there's nothing outside of what I've suggested it is. But I think there's somewhere in the middle where it's both the beholder and the producer. And I'm trying to sort of, provide in that context of a, of a festival, of a brand experience, that contour for that to occur, where the brand or the festival of the artist is saying something and I'm expanding the horizon of what that might be so that the audience can grasp it for themselves. So how did you arrive there? This is a very abstract way of expressing or creating art. You know, you've gone from conceptualizing to the experience you know for a lot of artists the focus is on honing in on the craft or the skill where yours has been about the experience you know what experience do you want your audience to have and the medium seems to have come secondary to that you know so that's take take us back through your journey take us back to the start of your journey i think that'll give us an idea of how you've arrived to, you know, where you're at now. Yeah, I think for me, so, I mean, I started doing visuals at my church when I was like 10, doing like the lyrics and very, um, if you grew up in church, that was sort of what you did. And so I've always been showing things of some sort 
in the context of experience and ritual and liturgy. And then when I was about 16, I did a like a community projection workshop. Um, and that really opened my horizons to, oh, I can do this sort of outside a religious community and I can actually make artwork in that form. And then I sort of got really into that for a number of years where I was trying to essentially grasp the things I had seen in, in a church context in the sense of you put a particular visual up and you evoke a reaction in a secular setting or a public setting of people aren't necessarily there for the same response or the same encounter, but people aren't necessarily there for something. And so I've been trying to intuit and to sort of grasp what that thing that they're reaching for might be. And I think that is a fundamentally an experiential thing. It's that I just know that I know that I know it's often not arrived at rationally. Um, and so in the background of my work is always that shaping factor of me being a 10 year old doing the lyrics. And over time it's just matured and become quite refined that it's, I mean, it's still refining. That's why I'm, I'm here now doing this masters, but I'm trying to understand how this experience occurs of what experiencing in and of itself is. You being a person of faith and having a deep connection with your spirituality, you would have experienced this heightened connection with art. And having had that connection and being intimate with it, are you capturing that felt experience and transferring it into your work? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, how would I say? I think we're all grasping for something and I think we rely on people, whether it's the artist, the poet, the hermit, the monk, the priest, like religious figures or philosophers or political figures, like we all grasp for something or someone to, to show us how to intuit our way around reality. Mm. And I think I'm trying to help with that. I heard a quote from a podcast I really like on being yesterday, actually, in Krista Tippett. She essentially says she just sort of defines religion as a way of us trying to comprehend reality. And I think that's where I sort of see it, where art helps us do that, to just simply comprehend what it is to see in in all five senses in a heightened way. Um so whether it's in a, a, a religious context or I guess a so-called secular context, there's no real distinction for me other than, I guess, the direction of where that individual's piety or devotion is going. So would you say that just day to day that it is where we're numb to that, that, mm. um, you know, we are seeking that. So we turn to art for that, for that inspiration in whatever form, whatever medium that is. So it's almost like, almost drug-like. Is it, is it altering our reality? I wouldn't say altering it, and I wouldn't say necessarily drug-like. I mean, there's certainly factors where people have, you know, ecstatic-like moments, and that's sort of mm. noted in religions all across the world. Um, but I would say art is helping us to perceive and intuit our way around reality and it does that fundamentally by informing and influencing our imagination mm. and i think if you run through that idea well then everything is influencing our imagination our economic framework our job our vocation the sheer amount of media we consume on instagram it's all influencing our imagination in some way and so then it is a matter of well what do i want to influence me and I think mm. that's where art becomes a very important person or an important subject because it's yes. often with people that are not just producing something, but they're, they're essential. Uh, they, they necessitate a lifestyle of a sort as well. This ties into you undertaking your master's, sort of like you feeding sustenance for the soul. 
Now, so tell us a bit about what you are studying right now. Yes, I'm studying a master's in Christianity and the Arts. It's at King, King's College and with the National Gallery. So it's sort of in collaboration with the gallery. We're on the gallery floor a few hours every week with their curators. And we're looking at the Renaissance period, in particular altarpieces, and how they both function as an aesthetic object, but also, I guess, the devotional and piety that is in altarpieces that is quite different to when it's just being shown in a museum context. Um, and I'm also doing a module on the idea of beauty in Western theology. So it's kind of a very broad sweep of how the idea of beauty has developed over time. Um, and it's great. I sort of, I came here because I wanted to get out of, I guess, my own head bubble of I'm, I've been working as an artist and in a commercial capacity for seven or eight years full time now. And I sort of, I'm trying to pivot that a little bit where I can bring in deeper considerations and more mature considerations of how we've, I guess, historically thought of art and the image. So I'm sort of, I, I say I'm taking a sabbatical for a little bit, but it's really just, <laughs> I've shifted my focus as what I'm doing for myself right now, yeah. What what was was there an absence in your work, or that you felt personally that you were not as well connected with what you're doing? I think um, I think yes, and I wouldn't know how to articulate what that absence was, but because I've been doing commercial work exclusively for about six or so years now. I found that the ideas I was trying to express, I could express it, but I didn't have the vocabulary for it. And particularly over the last few years, I sort of started getting commissioned as an artist myself, not just for my technical ability to produce a particular outcome, but people started really coming to me for my ideas themselves. Um, and so I figured I'm, I am, I guess, being commissioned for my ideas now and I really need to put my money where my mouth is and develop mm. the ideas themselves a bit more. Um, I got into this really good habit, I guess, and I don't know if this would come up later or not, where <clears throat> in my early days I would have an idea of what I'd want to produce as an artwork. And because I'm working with very new media like augmented reality and Instagram filters through to projection art, which is still, I mean, it's not as new, but it's still somewhat new. Um, I would produce artworks that I wanted to make for myself. And then I learned how to recast that into a light that would be suitable for brands. And so I'd make an Instagram filter and have a, have a group show as an Instagram filter over COVID. And then I recast that into the light that would be appealing to brands where I'm now able to make money off my art and my practice and develop that skill, which can then recycle into my art practice. And so I worked out how to make a very circular economy where it's, I'm testing out the waters and I'm making art that I want to, funneling that into getting paid for it. And I'm honing my skills at the same time and working with brands. And it allows me to then live and, and exist to keep making art. And so I've kind of hit pause on this to learn the education side a bit more on this side. Yeah. It can be a bit of a, a runaway train, can't it? When you get caught into this this cycle, this loop of, um, you know, when, when, when things start to, to work out and click in a certain way and you keep feeding that particular machine and you're kind of moving along with that, along that trajectory and by doing so, you lose touch of why you began doing it or where the um, success initially came from. So, you know, you're in the, this position where you are able just to, and you got hold of it at a point where it's early enough for you to um, to reclaim some of that control. And, you know, while you're still young enough to then go back and to build on your knowledge base and then just to inject it back into your work. So through your studying can you identify parallels in Renaissance work and art of today? You know, and how are you, how can you inject the essence of it into your work? Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know yet where or how it will, I guess, grow in my work because it's still quite early days. But what I've learned from it, I guess, is the necessity throughout much of history of art having a devotional element to it in that you kind of can't understand altar pieces in their original context without some sort of aspect of it evoking devotion and piety and praise or prayer. And I think in contrast to our modern period of how we sort of define art, we don't really have that. And I think Mm. much of history itself, particularly in the West, was beautiful objects calling devotion. And so you would have, you know, Christians would take over, I guess, a pagan town or somewhere, and they necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily um, destroy the statues or the the paintings or the works of, of art, but they would sort of add a cross to it. And so they're theologically... Um, destroying the devotion side, but then it becomes an object of, of simple, uh, of looking and observing and appreciating. And so I think there needs to be that tension of art has the capacity for devotion to something else, to something other, something transcendent. And so I wanted to go back in time to really where the height of that might be and see how that was understood. I see, I see your work aspiring to that. You know, you described it as ethereal, which is accurate. So when you're augmenting spatial reality or heightening the musical experience, you, you are inviting the audience to participate in or to transcend into this new space. You know, you have a, you have, you have a way of finding harmony in your approach to your work. Is this something that you've consciously developed? I think so. <laughs> I mean, my earliest sort of memory of of knowing I needed to work so hard for that particular outcome was I think I was like 13 and I got my parents to sign a little signature in the bottom of my resume and I started working at a Donut King when I was like 13, or maybe 14, every, most days after school to save up for, I think it took me about two years to save up for my first MacBook. And it was just every day I'd work for a few hours, go home, do my homework. And at this, the other side of that, I started learning how to take photos and video, but I had no place to really edit it and to make the product that I wanted to make or the artwork I wanted to make. I just had it all sitting there. And two years went by and I finally had enough money for the MacBook. And then I think within six months I had my first commission And it was sort of like that two year process of working so hard of, of really knowing what I wanted to make. So then so quickly then translated into a commission of some sort. Um, and so I've always seen as that it's, you really need to put in the hard yards in yourself and your character and how you're developing because then it just naturally comes out in whatever you do. My first sort of project for myself when I got that MacBook was called 15 Second Vibes. I think I was 15 at the time. And essentially that was me every week for 2015, I think. I would produce a 15 second video. And so that was at the time when Instagram just launched their 15 second video limit. And Mm. so I was trying to play into that context. And the sheer purpose of that was, I know that creativity is a muscle and it needs to be exercised. And so I told myself every every week for that year, 15 seconds, no matter how good it is or how crap it is, I've just got to make something. And so I did that for the year. And then at the end of it, I, I went to the projection workshop. I did the projection workshop and I realized my work could be shown outside of Instagram you know, in a real world setting. And then three months later, I showed my first projection in, in a cafe on Flinders Lane. And then that rolled over into the guy that owned the cafe, commissioning me to produce a commercial video of his cafe for his social media because he liked what I had done with 15 Second Vibes. And then, so that landed into my first commission. And then he told his friend that just opened a cafe over in North Melbourne about my work. 
and that launched into my second commission. And then at the same time, I'm posting videos of my projection art that's been showing. And then that toppled into some musician friends who followed me being like, hey, you do visuals, sick. Can we get you for festivals and like concerts and our gigs? Which toppled into, you know, 200 capacity shows and then meeting their promoters and managers, which then eventuated into what it is now. So it was really that year long commitment to the 15 second videos really propelled me into both the commercial world concerts and my own practice. This false habit goes beyond discipline. You were actively seeking out adversity for the benefit of growth. Now, how many of those videos would have just been utter trash, but you still found value in putting it out there? I think probably a lot of them when I look back. (laughs) I think for me it was coming to terms every Sunday afternoon before I hit post and being like, oh, man, I don't know how I feel about this, with just telling myself it really doesn't matter. I'm not doing Mm. this for the approval of others. I'm doing this to prove to myself that creativity is a muscle that can be taught and learned and is something that develops both as taste and as skill. And if I'm not sharing this, I'm not being accountable to myself through others. That's a very mature way of approaching your development. You know, this is something that I've had to combat with and recognize that I had this sense of inadequacy that was masquerading as perfection. And it was preventing me from showcasing my work, from putting it out there and being open to criticism. And in many ways, it stunted my growth. You know, there's the growth is in vulnerability especially in the creative sense, you know, that's, that's how, that's how we connect. You know, we have, uh, we can sense authenticity and we gravitate towards the humanistic elements in art. So the emotional expression and, and imperfections, if you will. You know, so looking at your journey, it is, it has created momentum and it has helped pave your way. And, now you're immersing yourself deeper in art with this move to London. Right? So how has this affected you? Has it been has it been jarring? I think it's been really freeing for me, to be honest. I think my work and where I'm hoping it would go, it feels as though there's a lot of people here that are having similar conversations about, I guess, the faith broadly and how faith intersects with art and it's sort of essential uh, the essential capacity of art to say something about faith and the the essentiality of faith to say something about art and so I felt like being here I'm really able to immerse myself in a conversation that I've wanted to be a part of for quite some time Um, so I guess for me it's not been necessarily jarring it's been more freeing Mm-hmm. that it's finally I'm, I'm in a conversation that I've longed to be a part of. It's, it's almost a feeling of being untethered. I wouldn't say untethered. I would say it's, I came here knowing I had a very specific goal and that was to do the master's course and to really reflect in this year of how that might translate back to my practice. And I mean, I've only been doing the course for about 10 weeks now, so it's sort of hard to comment on the reflective part yet, but I know that for me, if I can get to this time next year, knowing very clearly, okay, this part situates in this part of my practice, that will be the best sort of outcome of having moved here. Yeah, you mentioned early on that, you know, when you take the the artwork, when you take the work out of its context, it does lose some of its meaning, some of its significance. You know, that we are analyzing it through the lens of it just being artwork where back then it wasn't necessarily meant to be viewed in the same way. So what would it have been then and how has it differed to how we see it now? So if we're seeing it out of context, could the the value that we are prescribing to it, could it possibly just be inaccurate? I wouldn't say inaccurate. I would say it just, there's 
always an abundance of meaning, I think, in every period waiting to be seen that we just don't have the eyes for because we're not in that period. And so specifically with altarpieces, you because that's what my study's been in, is you see this real dramatization of ritual, of the mass. So you have the priest, he's sort of praying over the, the elements and he lifts up the host. And then in the background of all that is the artwork that's really situating this piece of bread that they believe becomes Christ in this broader history where you might have saints on this side from the third century, from the 10th century. Then on this side, you might have, you know, Mary, like the Virgin Mother and, and John the Baptist. And in the middle, you might have, you know, the mother and, and, and Jesus as a child. And so even in that, you've seen sort of a collapse of time being evoked for the purpose of essentially history. What they're saying is history is present alongside us as we watch this host be raised up for us to partake mm. of. You put that into, you know, a gallery context where there's no seats, there's no, there's no, there's no priest. Of course, you are going to appreciate it just as an object. But I think there needs to be that healthy tension of it's both. Hmm. Yes. Okay. So then that's when it comes back down and we can loop that back to the experiential art where it's, um, you know, that when you take it out of the context, the experience now has changed. The experience has shifted into something that wasn't as intended. And, you know, with, with your work, then it is very contextual, 100% contextual, that it can't really evoke the same emotion, the same sentiment in a different setting at a different time. Anything that's altered from that, it changes everything, changes the entire art piece itself. What we, we, we spoke on the, when we caught up when you were here in town, how you would love to take your work and do more collaborative work with um, other artists that, that evoke various senses as well. You know, when, you, when you're speaking about wanting to, to work with uh, chefs, culinary um and to not just not just in a in a visual setting but um but to to evoke and to elicit or to heighten other senses and just to use your work as a complementary component how how could you do that what are the other other avenues to take your work um and and to channel that Good question. I think, I mean, I've always worked for 95% of my work in a collaborative way where I don't think I've worked with a chef yet. I would really love that though. But yeah. I, I, I've worked with visual artists, musicians, designers, um, all sorts of people. I think for me, I really love the curatorial aspect of what I do a lot of the time as well, where it's, yes, I'm producing something, but I'm also often invited to, I guess, curate a space and as an event. And I guess I'd like to move my practice towards more of an event based thing where it's my artwork is the event and the way that the people that are there attending might leave afterwards. And so, yeah, there might be elements of projection or media that I produce, but I'm, maybe it is working with, you know, a chef to have like a long feasting table where we're playing on, you know, a theological or a philosophical idea where there's cue cards down at all and we're asking questions. But for me, the artwork that I'm producing in that sense isn't the thing that you're looking at the whole time. It's who you're becoming in that brief hour and a half. Is this what's next for experiential art? You know, technology, technology's played a big role in allowing you to do what you do. So considering where it's going, what does the future of experiential art look like? 
Good question. <laughs> um, I think it can run two ways. I think, and you see it sort of developing at the moment. I mean, I don't know where things are at in Melbourne and if things have popped up, but in London, there's a lot of immersive experiences that you can go to. I mean, Loom is probably something kind of like that where it's very explicit in what it's trying to do. But I think the future of experiential art is not so much as a particular sort of art as it is, I think, a general awareness of what it is to be human. And so I think in that we'll either go down the path of, and it's probably both of these at the same time, of some brands will get it. And I think they'll understand that probably being super explicit and blunt about your product placement isn't going to work for experiential contexts where people are trying to be immersed in a particular narrative. And if that brand is the only thing they're seeing, it's not necessarily evoking the imagination to situate it within the broader narrative of their own life. And so I think we'll see some brands and I think we are seeing that they're really grasping that idea that you need to place product within a broader story. That's always happened, I think. But I think it's becoming more explicit in the necessity of it being smell, of it being touch, of it being taste, of it being sight, that that's only going to become more refined in how that is outworked. And then I think on the other side, you might see brands that just don't get that. And I think that contrast will look very obvious to consumers. And I think that will naturally ripple down into art of some sort of how that is sort of being, I guess, counted by artists that it's experienced in that sense, but with no real brand emphasis. So you think it's going to be commercially driven first? I would say yes, in the sense of it being explicitly identified by people. But I think Mm -hmm. you go back a hundred years ago to, you know, abstract expressionist movement of saying like Mark Rothko, he's been doing that. It's already done in the sense of when you're encountering his work, the feeling that you feel is the work and he's sharing that with you. And so artists have done it. They've always done that. But I think in our malaise, I think it'll be brands that really make us aware of that and that that's always been there. I don't know though. You know, creative cultural shifts come about from counterculture, you know, where the expression is to challenge the status quo. And this is the role of the artist. This is the risk that they take. You know, brands will come in when there's a general acceptance by the people, by culture. But in saying that, the big shifts, the big cultural seismic shifts, they, you know, they come about when there is commercial backing, when it is provided to the masses. Hmm. Yeah, I think what I mean by that is art has always been doing that. And I think the general acceptance, I mean, people go to galleries for that experience. People go to Disneyland because they subconsciously realize that when they step into a different themed park in Disneyland, that the ground feels different. That's an Mm. intentional shift that Disneyland does on the surface of their floor so that it feels softer or it feels harder depending on the part of the park you're in. People have always been drawn to that, but I think it, in our malaise of such transaction where it's often quite easy for us to go into a museum and we have this nice experience or transcend an encounter or deep emotion, we then can think to ourselves that by leaving the museum space, I have now left that there. And there's no Mm. further reflection on, no, that still influences me today. And I think it has to be brands or or commercialization, whether that's a positive or negative, I think that will shift that because we're so stuck in this black and white mindset that I can go to this place and have an encounter of some sort and leave it there. 
and I go here to do my my reasoning. But I think it has to be brand because I don't think I don't think we can think ourselves out of that because mm-hmm. we're so consumer driven. Yeah. Yeah, this comes back to brands being cultural leaders. And as we're moving into you know, these technological frontiers, it's becoming more dehumanizing. We're craving for more human experiences and engaging with brands that offer those experiences. So yeah, maybe maybe that's the right approach is to find the balance between creativity and commercial work and collaborate with brands that want to be at the forefront as cultural leaders. You know, like, like your most recent collaboration with New Balance. Can you talk to us talk to us through that? You know, that's because that was that was pretty incredible, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I've done a, a couple of jobs with them now and, and Sneaker Freaker, which has been awesome. They have been so great to work with and I'm so appreciative for their collaborative mindset. Um, I guess the first one was for their Grey Day, which was back in May 2023, so about, what, five months ago at this point? Um, and essentially they had sent me a brief with a couple sort of questions that they'd like me to tease out in response to it essentially on the idea of what does gray mean and how does gray shape our understanding quite broad, which I actually appreciated. Um, and so that was themed around um, a day to celebrate gray day. And that was at Chin Chin, which is in Melbourne, beautiful restaurant. They had a custom menu laid out, which was really emphasizing gray as a color for food, which again, isn't even a thing that you often don't buy gray food. That's not a thing no. that evokes excitement or, or, or taste. But the food was amazing. There was music curated for the whole night. And what I was trying to do in that is there's an element of I'm responding to it as a brand. And so I need to emphasize the product and, and its situation within Grey Day. And so I created sort of a commercial piece where the shoes that are being projected interacting with the physical shoes on display. And that is really just me easing the people's minds into that being an interplay of the physical space with the projected space, that it's the shoes that you're seeing move are the shoes that are physical, that there is that sort of, I guess, spiritual dimension, right? Mm -hmm. That it's that overlay of things that can be turned off at the blink of an eye. But at first glance, it's just a really cool projection that's interacting with the shoes. And then as the music sort of happens along the night, I then shift that into these more, I guess, ephemeral, fluid, fluidy, grey textures that are immersing you on the screen. And for me in that, I'm, I'm really trying to say that it's still being projected over the shoes, but you can't have this that's now being projected. You can have the shoes that are physical, but you actually can't get what I'm projecting. You can only experience it. Mm. And it's in theme with Grey Day, this idea that I I spoke about, I was on a panel for it, where we often see white and light and darkness as these two polar opposites, but it's grey that's always in the middle. And it's grey that's always going beyond these two absolutes because it's always the synthesis between both. And for me, that's where spirituality lays, because it's always in the the synthesis of these two absolutes that say it has to be this way or it has to be that way. And I think that is actually where the infinite lays, and it's always going beyond, and you can't hold it. You can only participate in it. And that's where the grey comes out, that you can't take this. You just have to be in it and hear the music and eat some delicious gray food. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really interesting way, in, yeah, interesting way of putting it. And no, I get that. You know, when you're talking about the black and the white, they are absolutes. And there's the, and the space in between is infinite. It can be broken down in so many different ways that there's, there's an infinite array spread of grades which is, I, I can see how you've managed to draw parallels between that and spirituality. Pretty clever. Thanks. 
<laughs> no, I like that. Shit, man, I can sit on that one for a little while. <clears throat> mm. I wouldn't have thought that you could take a concept of grey and have taken it to that place. But I suppose that when you're working with uh, your projections and your artwork where it is something that is unreal, not quite, not literally, but metaphorically unreal, it is something that that is ethereal, that you, it is just a moment in time, much like the greys. I can see the parallels there. I love that. I love that. Man, yeah, I could sit on that one for a little while, man. I really like that, dude. That was well. That was I, I just to be able to take a concept of grey and then just to move it into that space, man. So with um, what's what we've covered, what's next up for you as well? So you're going to be taking a bit of time off. Um, when do you think you'll be getting back on the tools? I'm really not too sure. Yeah, yeah. This course goes for a year. I might get on the tools a bit earlier depending on on how that looks um but honestly i just in myself i know there's a place i want to be of both my character and my philosophy and theology behind what i do and i i guess i'd say i'm scared to produce anything before i can articulate that in how i know it needs to be articulated and so whether that is this time next year, whether it's a few years, to be honest, I'm, I'm not putting a hard thing on it. For me, I just know that if I'm going to put the work with its right value, I need to be able to explain that and express that right. Because I know I can jump back into what I do so easily, but I feel like I would be doubting myself the whole time from this point onwards if I were to jump back in without knowing that. Is it something that you need to put into practice and, and to, to work on it along the way? Because if, if it's something that where you're not able to accurately express it or you're not able to, if, if you can't articulate it with the right visual vocabulary, it's something that you'll have to, much like learning a language, right? Like if you throw yourself in there, so as you're learning and then you jump back in the tools, you're able to then manage to work out what your new language is. I'm not prescribing that that's yeah. what you do. No. But, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, when you're talking about of the fear of not being able to articulate it correctly, you know, just throw caution in the wind. Definitely, maybe. I mean, like I might get, mm. you know, six months away and be like, oh, crap, that's exactly what I need to do. Um, but I think on the other hand, I if I'm committed to it, art being an experiential thing I need to commit myself to experiencing first and I think that's the Mm. distinction for me that it's I can't give of what I've not experienced I am excited to see what comes of this You you are an incredibly deep thinker you have a knack for absorbing information interpreting interpreting the nuance of it compartmentalizing and then nurturing it in a way before putting it out there that can only be understood when experienced. You know, paired with your discipline, your work ethic and the passion for your craft, I'm truly excited to see what comes of this when the timing is right. And for people that want to get up to speed with your work, where can they find you or how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, my website's got a lot of my work and you can kind of contact me through that or just Instagram. Mate, I want to wrap this up here, dude. That has been very inspiring, very eye-opening and, man, like I said, I'm very excited to see what comes off this. Thanks, mate. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Mm.